Shalom, shalom to all of our friends, all friends of Bnei David. Happy Purim. Purim is uh, such a special festival. And when we ask people what Purim is all about, many of them, especially the children, they'll speak about dressing up, the costumes, and the masks. Though, we don't exactly know when this began and why. Because there are a lot of minhagim and mitzvot in Purim, but um, dressing up and masquerades, that's not really part of it. It doesn't appear in the Talmud. It doesn't appear in the main halacha books that we know. We know that it's a minhag, a custom that has become universal. All different kinds of Jews in Purim in different countries, they, uh, uh, they uh, dress up on Purim. But the question is, why? Well, some people... Oh, wait a minute. I think that's enough. So, some people would say... I walked 90 kilometers to get this beret, the red beret. They walk less these days. Okay, so um, some people, some people uh, give uh, different kinds of explanations, and one of them is that you know every every culture, every nation, they have the day that they dress up. You know, in the United States, we know uh, Halloween, and the Jews just picked it up from the the goyim around them. Um, this might be true historically, but it isn't, uh, it isn't precise spiritually, because the special thing about uh, the Jewish religion, culture, is that when we adopt a certain minhag, we make it our own, which means we connect it to the inner spirit of Klal Yisrael. If it doesn't, it doesn't suit the inner spirit, then we just, you know, we, we, we won't accept it. And the fact that the Jews as the people have accepted this minhag, this custom, it means that uh, the way we do it, it has me meaning and significance. And it goes together with the basic ideas of Purim and Kedusha, uh, generally speaking. Rav Kook says that the greatest Talmud Chachem, the greatest Talmud Chachem is Klal Yisrael, which means, you know, you can have a certain poisik uh, uh, with, with an opinion on a matter, and somebody else might think the otherwise, and there are uh, great tzaddikim and poskim, but at the end, you know, there's there certain things that the people, as a people, adopt, and uh, that that's because an inner feeling, a special inner feeling, which is uh, some kind of national ruach hakodesh that Klal Yisrael has. So if we did adopt this minhag, maybe we learned it on the external level from other cultures, but the way we do it, it has meaning and significance and importance. So I want to offer one kind of uh, uh, explanation for this uh, minhag. And it would be based on the characters of the Megillah. Because in the characters of the Megillah that we read on Purim, Megillah Tester, none of them, absolutely none of them, are really what they seem to be. They're all, you know, dressed up. They're all in this kind of masquerade. And this is important for all of us to remember because we have, if there's uh, anything we can learn from modern psychology, it's that the last thing a person is, is what he pretends to be. I don't mean that we're all uh, hypocrites, but, you know, we have different levels of consciousness and we all have our persona, our mask, the kind of person we might want to be or the kind of personality that we want to project and we want people to think that we are, but deep down, there's something else. Now, this we agree upon with modern psychology. The, the question is, and that's where the big machloket is between us, is what is in there? What is uh, buried deep down there? Now, I'm not going to get into a psychology course here, but basically, if you know uh, the writings of uh, Sigmund Shlomo, by the way, his name was Shlomo, uh, Shlomo Sigmund uh, Freud, or Adler, or others, they usually gave a very um, not complementary explanations about who the inner person is. You know, Freud has his theory, Adler has, has, has his, there are others, but usually it's something very uh, primitive and primal, and uh, I would say even be, uh, uh, man as some kind of a beast who's trying to cover it up with a uh, human... Uh, cultured behavior, but deep down there's something really, really, I wouldn't say bad, but, uh, you know, more like an animal than, than, than a person 
or very, very uh, materialistic, uh, very, very basic. Now, of course, that's also part of mankind. That's what we call the Yitzhahara. Uh, Yitzhahara doesn't have to be an evil inclination. It can also be the Nefesh Behemit, like in the, uh, the Tanya, uh, which would mean something that's more the, the animal side, uh, the uh, raw material side of man. But Judaism differs from these views in believing that much more deeper than all of that, there's something godly, there's something divine in uh, man's spirit. Uh, Hashem created us all, B'Tselem and Ukim. There's something, uh, th- there's a, a small piece of heaven. I just remember that wonderful song, I think, uh, written by A.B. Rottenberg. There's a small piece of heaven in everybody, in everyone's uh, soul, in everybody's heart. And uh, Kalal Yisrael has a special piece of this, as because we're the only... Uh, nation who has it on the national level, our le'umiyut, uh, our national existence, there's something divine in it. Hashem chose us as a nation, as a people. But this inner uh, quality that people have, it's difficult to live up to it in our everyday life. In a way, you can say that the whole idea of Judaism is trying to bridge the gap between our uh, inner neshama and the way we really behave and think and act and try to, try to be more uh, loyal to, to our inner spirit. And uh, this has much to do with the costumes because in Purim, we wear a costume, but actually a lot of, uh, a lot of our costumes, they come off. That's the same idea, by the way, about the drinking in Purim. That's also th- something that's not originally Jewish, drinking much, uh, much wine. But when we do it in Purim, we do it in the atmosphere of Kedusha. Of course, uh, you should have some restric- restrictions on it. But we, when we do it in the atmosphere of uh, Kedusha Tayom and all of the deep, wonderful, holy, sanctified ideas of Purim, so Chazal say, Nichnas Yain Yatsas Sod. We have a secret, and it's a good secret. That's, that's where we differ from modern psychology. We both agree that we have a secret to us, but we believe that that secret is good, and it's holy, it's divine. And we got to sometimes go uh, around our conscious, uh, conscious thoughts to reach our inner quality. And sometimes when you uh, dress up and you put on a costume, then that allows you to be a bit more who you really are. Okay, what we call in Hebrew, hafuch alafuch. Like, all year round, we're actually in, ca- in disguise. And when we're in disguise on Purim, we can actually be ourselves again. We can connect to that inner quality. Now, like I said, in the Megillah, uh, in, the, in, the, in the scroll of Esther, so this is all very clear because everybody there is putting up some kind of a, uh, some kind of a play and everybody is acting. And I'll just give a few examples. I won't get into the depth of all this, but uh, let's begin with Queen Esther. Because in Queen Esther, it's the most obvious, because she's literally undercover, right? It says, Ein Esther magedet moladet ama. She doesn't want to be a part of this whole thing. Remember, all the women in Persia, they wanted to be chosen by Ahasuerus. I, I know there are all kind of reality programs of... Finding, uh, uh, finding your wife, but that was the original crazy reality program in which all of the, the young women had to be uh, a part of it, but most of them wanted to be chosen by Hashverosh, and they did their best to be chosen, but Esther didn't want to be. She didn't want to be the queen. She definitely didn't want to be married to uh, this guy. Um, she was, she was uh, chosen. Maybe the fact that she was chosen is just because Hashverosh understood, again, not, uh, it doesn't have to be on the conscience uh, level, but he understood that she's the only one who didn't want him. He's a conqueror. He wants to conquer. And all the women, they want to be, you know, no, because it says that he was, she was the most beautiful. But we all know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And there were so many women, and they did much more to uh, be attractive to Ahasuerus. And at the end, he wanted Esther. Why did he want her? Because she didn't want him. She, she couldn't say that blatantly, but he understood that there's a secret. He understood that there's... Also, maybe he, maybe he managed to, to notice the, the wonderful, uh, holy, special quality in, in, in Esther, and he wanted a, a part of that. Anyway, so she's in disguise. She doesn't want to be the queen. She doesn't want to be married to Ahasuerus. She doesn't tell him 
what her people is. Uh, the, she doesn't uh, share that she's uh, she's Jewish, and uh, so that's her persona. That's what uh, on the out on the outside level, uh, the external level, Esther looks to be the queen of, of of Persia. But actually, in her inner side, she's she's a Jewish she's a Jewish girl uh, who cares about her people. She cares about uh, our destiny. Cares about, of course, uh, Mordechai, and she. She puts her life at danger a few times, a few times, uh, to fulfill her job. True, she needed a little encouragement. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't need this encouragement when you know you can literally find yourself uh, killed by 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 a for any uh, any any um, change from the uh, regular bad practices of his inner court. So Esther is definitely uh, undercover and she's in disguise and. Towards the end of the Megillah, we discover who everybody discovers who Esther really was. Okay, so she's uh, undercover. What about Achashverosh? Achashverosh, we got to think what he wants us to think about him and who he truly is, because like everybody in this Megillah, it's the opposite. Achashverosh, he's uh, he wants to show himself to be a very strong leader. Okay, he does pretty crazy things and he does them on a whim. Easily, all kinds of decrees, you know, uh, at the beginning, first of all, he, he, he holds these lavish, uh, crazy uh, parties, free with wine to, for, for everybody, and uh, inviting everybody, and he rules the, like the whole world, it's never literally the whole world, but Chazal say there were three people who, who, who ruled the whole world, one of them was Achashverosh, 127 well, maybe not in the Tanakh. It's in exactly countries, but uh, it's it's big enough. It's big enough. Okay, so he's this great emperor holding wild parties, and when his wife doesn't uh, do exactly what what he wants, so he just kills her off or banishes her. There are different perushim. What exactly happened to Vashti? But basically, he uh, disposes of her very easily. And then uh, there's a people. There's one guy, one guy who makes his uh, his, his vice president Haman. A bit angry, so he's gonna wipe out the whole na- his whole nation, which is absolutely crazy. It's not only the evil, uh, like a Hitler kind of uh, uh, policy, but it's it's just the craziness and just just to make this the, this decision because one guy asked because the whole thing is crazy. Okay, it's true we know the happy ending, but Purim is a really really hard story before the happy ending, and it's important, especially when we're, we're conveying it to, to our children who know it's a uh, you know it's, uh, it's such a festive and uh, wonderful and happy, happy day. They should understand the harsh uh, beginning of the Megillah. So, uh, and then, and then he goes back on this this policy. Also, suddenly, and at the beginning, he listens to Haman and does what 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 he says, and at the end, he just hangs his, his this important person. He hangs him with no problem. So Achashverosh seems to be a very very strong leader, and we know that leaders, especially dictators, they wanna. I'm not going to get into the Russian Ukraine. Why should I make that comment? Forget it. But I'm just saying we know that dictators they want us everybody to think that they're very strong uh, characters, but actually he's weak. He might be the weakest person in the whole story of the Megillah. He's very weak. He does nothing. He does nothing unless somebody else t- tells him to do it. He he has uh, no dea, no opinion of his own. And we can see that everything he does in the Megillah uh, is is at somebody else's uh, request, okay, like the idea that uh, after uh, he gets, uh, first of all, to get rid of Vashdi, that was Haman and his uh, Sarisim, his uh, henchmen, henchmen would be a perfect translation for Sar- Sarisim in this Megillah, so it's Haman or Memuchan and his henchmen that they tell him to get rid of, that's against his interest to get rid of his wife, but he does it because they told him to do it, and then the idea to remarry by having this crazy reality program where all the young uh, women in the country have to uh, have to come b- b- before him. Okay, that that's a very problematic dating uh, technique. Okay, don't try it. Uh, don't try it at home. So that's also not his idea. It's Naare Hamelech Umeshartav. By the way, Naare Hamelech. These are young people. These are young people. And Naar in modern Hebrew is. Uh, the, the, uh, it's the, a teenager, okay? And also in the Tanakh, nar, nar, it could be a child or a teenager. Think about the kind of people who would have this idea uh, on how to find your mate, okay? So it's a pretty crazy idea, and he does it because he was told by his na'arim, na'arim, and his servants, Mishartav, 
and the idea to wipe out a whole nation is just because Haman told him to do it. And even the idea, when he understands who Haman really is, the idea to have him hanged was not his as, uh, either. It was Harvona, right? Harvona Zachulatov. Harvona gave him that idea. And even you know, the, the, the most uh, expected thing to do is to cancel the Gzerah against the Jews. But he doesn't even have the common sense to do that. Okay, he wiped out, okay, he killed Haman, but the idea to cancel the Gzera, Esther has to tell him this. In chapter 8, Pasuk 5, Esther tells uh, Achashverosh that he has to, you know, it's like a child, you have to tell him everything, what to do. Okay, and the, basically the whole idea, his whole policy, to make everybody happy. You can't make everybody happy. That's the opposite of leadership. Good leadership is deciding what your preferences are and uh, explaining your policy. And there are always going to be people who are disappointed because every real constructive policy has certain people who are, who are going to be disappointed. And of course, it's a challenge uh, to explain your policy to those people. But, you know, you can't do Kirtzon Ish Ish. It doesn't work uh, that way. And uh, that's the story of Achashverosh. And the whole mix between uh, the the personal and the national level, okay? He, he, he makes national decisions of life, or, uh, life and death based on very, very personal things that are going on in his life, which is also an example of bad leadership. So this guy is not strong at all. There is one brilliant thing that he does in the Megillah. You know, in the Chazal, there's a machloket, if he was uh, more evil or more stupid. Um, based on everything I said uh, till, till now, we might say tipesh, stupid, but uh, now I'm going to uh, uh, reverse it a bit because there's something really, really brilliant he does. And that's the first uh, documented pr- projective test that I know. Uh, um, and uh, what am I talking about? Okay, so in psychology, we have the idea that since your consciousness is not who you really are, interviewing somebody and asking him about himself and his strengths and weaknesses and uh, preferences, that won't give us a, a real picture about the person because not, not because he's lying. We're not talking about liars. We're just talking about, you know, people would like to think certain things about themselves and they would like us to believe certain things about, about them. And we want to know who you really are. So uh, that's why they invented the projective tests, Proje- like the, the Rorschach and the TAT, uh, uh, those cards. Basically, they give you a very vague uh, situation, and they ask you to say something about it. Like, what do you see in the picture where there's nothing in the picture? It's just uh, uh, ink on a paper. Or they'll tell you to write a story about uh, a certain scene, and the scene, it's not exactly clear what's happening there. And since it's vague, and since they don't tell you that it's about you, I'm not supposed to tell you this because this is going to ruin uh, some of these tests for, for uh, the psychologists. But uh, basically, uh, I'll give it to you. All right. Uh, basically, the idea is that when you're writing about somebody uh, that you see in this, in this scene, you're actually writing about yourself. If we ask you directly about yourself, you're going to tell us a story that isn't 100% true. Not because you're lying, because you're maybe a bit lying to yourself as well. But when we ask you about somebody else and you write it, you're actually projecting. That's why it's called a projective test. You're projecting your persona, your inner spirit on uh, on, on these characters that you can see in in the picture. So you're writing a story about somebody else, but you're actually telling us about who you really are. Okay, that's the secret of a projective test. And that's exactly what Achashverosh does to Haman. Because Achashverot starts um, suspecting Haman. Uh, there's something very strange, and this is the brilliance of Esther, okay? Because she invites, uh, she, she wants Achashverot to cancel the decree. So what does she do? She invites him to an intimate party. And who does she invite to this intimate party? Herself, her husband, and the vice president, or whatever Haman would be called today. Why does she invite him to the party? This is very strange, and uh, she, she's actually bringing Haman into the intimate relationship between her and Achashverosh. And why does he do this? Because she knows that to move Achashverosh, you can't speak about um, of values or morality or the suffering of her people. He has to feel that uh, he has to feel threatened personally on the personal level by Haman. Only when that will happen, then uh, we'll be able to shift his his policy. 
which is bad, but she, she excuse me for uh, uh, using this phrase, but it says, Yodea Tzadik Nefesh Behemto. A righteous person knows his, his behemoth, his animal, and she, she, she knows Achashverosh. So that's what she's doing. That's why she doesn't tell, on, on the first night, Achashverosh says, what do you want me to do? She doesn't tell. That's like a, a golden opportunity. He's asking her what she wants, and she could have said uh, uh, the, the whole story and, and to change the, the terrible uh, decree on the Jewish nation. But she doesn't do it. She says, come to party again with me tomorrow. Okay, so she, she's building his suspicion, uh, especially towards Haman. And that's why he doesn't fall asleep well at night. He can't fall asleep. The Megillah doesn't say it specifically, but I think it's pretty obvious. So he, he can't fall asleep. And then they start reading him this whole story about what happened with Big Tan and Teresh many years ago, by the way. It was many years uh, before that. And then suddenly Haman comes in. And what does Achashverosh do? Achashverosh asks Haman, what do you think I should do for somebody else, not for you, for somebody else that I owe him, okay? If he would ask Haman di- directly, Haman wouldn't tell the truth. But since he, th- this is the projective test. And then it says, Vayomer Haman belibo. He said in his inner heart, uh, who would Achashverosh want to do a favor more than, more than myself? Okay, so since we're a bit in a psychoanalytic uh, 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 mood here, I would say when it says, Vayomer Haman Belibo, okay, this uh, Shlomo Freud would like this perush, I would say it's not in his, in his conscious uh, thought. Belibo would mean his subconsciousness, okay? Not that Haman exactly... Uh, thought this clearly. But when he answered, the Megillah is telling us, when he answered Achashverosh about how to do a favor to a citizen, he's actually projecting uh, his own uh, persona. And that's why he has a very, very strange request. Because any of us, think of yourself in that situation. If uh, the king, the emperor of the world would say, you know, ask for one thing for me, what would you want? So we, 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 would, we might want to be exempt from taxes. Um, maybe on the more positive side, we, we might want a treasure, we might want security, we might want a Rolls Royce. The last thing that a normal uh, citizen would ask for is to wear the shirt, <laughs> to wear the king's shirt and to ride his horse for one day and for some... Uh, this is a very strange request, okay? And somebody's going to have to uh, uh, say this... The, Nothing is left after that. It's just one day riding on the horse. It's a very childish and strange request. Okay? But actually, what does Achashverosh understand from this projective test? That Haman wants to be king. Because Haman wants to wear... Uh, he doesn't say it about himself. He says it about uh, somebody else. But he actually means himself. Haman So Haman, he wants... Uh, to wear the king's shirt, and he wants to wear uh, to ride the king's horse, and he wants uh, somebody, some bodyguard to run before him. That means that he actually wants to be the king. And now Achashverosh is personally threatened. He couldn't care less for the destiny of millions of Jews across his kingdom who are going to be wiped out in one day. But when it threatens him personally, and you know, Haman, first of all, he might want his wife, and that's why he's in this party. And that happens later on with a bed, but we're not going to get into that now. Uh, when, he, uh, when, when, again, there's brilliance of maneuvering Haman into uh, being in that situation when uh, King Achashverosh comes back and sees him on, on, on his bed, and he says, which means he uh, suspects Haman of wanting his wife and wanting his kingdom. And then this is the most important point in the Megillah. This is when everything, everything turns from bad to good. And this is when the downfall of Haman begins. Now, what about Haman himself? Haman, Haman, I know they call him Haman, but I'm going to call him in the Hebrew Haman. Um, I don't know what they called him in Persia. So uh, Haman, he also pretends to be, you know, some ruthless guy who does whatever he wants. And uh, if one guy, one guy uh, messes with him, he's going to wipe out his whole people. Very impressive. Okay, uh, evil, but uh, but impressive. But actually, he's also weak. Okay, the whole uh, why is Purim called Purim because of the poor, the goral. He, uh, you know, if you want to. Uh, remember that, uh, who was that, Clint Eastwood, who said, if you want to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Or if you have to shoot. I don't know, I didn't see the movie. I know the sentence, though. It's a famous quote. So, uh, if I'm on, you want to wipe out the Jewish nation, do it. Chas but do it. What does he do? Instead, 
he he takes this whole raffle system and he ends up getting the worst date which is almost a year after uh it's the latest date and meanwhile he has uh he can do nothing to mordechai and mordechai keeps on taunting him by not bowing down to him and he's frustrated and it drives him crazy but he doesn't dare do anything so he's hiding be- be- behind this, this 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 raffle okay and behind destiny and behind the gods or something like that he doesn't really have the power to do it he doesn't have the, the power to, 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 to make a move on his own. He doesn't have the courage to really stand up uh, in front of Mordechai. He's trying to recruit Achashverosh and the country's, uh, country's power, but he does it all in a, very, <clears throat> in a very weak way. Excuse me. So, uh, and he's also not conscious at all of his situation because, you know, when the downfall begins of Haman, he could have stopped it. He should have understood when he ended up uh, <clears throat> when he ended up being the one leading Mordechai in the streets of uh, Shushan, Habira, he should have understood that things are not going his way. And what does he do? He double downs in his policy and then he makes the tree. Okay? And then he loses, he loses the support of even his, his, his wife and their friends. They suddenly uh, say, Oh, Mordechai is Jewish. We didn't know this. They're telling him, everybody, it becomes transparent. Everybody knows how this is going to end. And they pretend suddenly that they didn't even know that Mordechai was Jewish. So he can see that everybody, if he had eyes, he would see that everybody around him is backing, backing, backing out of this situation. He's the only one who's going to be uh, stuck in it. Okay, and I'm sure that also changed uh, the the atmosphere with his supporters. Okay, because you know you, you remember that Achashverosh didn't cancel the decree because he's such a weak person that he can't even cancel his own law. He has to make another law, just saying you can attack the Jews. That law is still uh, intact, but the Jews can attack. Uh, they can defend themselves. That's the only difference. So actually, till uh, till D-Day of the Megillah, nobody knew. What's gonna? What, what, what would be the outcome? He didn't cancel the possibility to attack the Jews, but the Amalekim, the uh, helpers of, of of Haman and his supporters, they, they they left him. They left him. By the way, this is also because of economic reasons, but um, we'll get into that some other time. Bezrat Hashem. Mordechai. What about Mordechai? Mordechai is also undercover. Okay, if we would ask uh, an average Persian or even somebody in the uh, in the uh, government, who Mordechai is, so they would say he's a civil servant, he's a, a patriotic Persian, okay, he saved the king's li- life, he didn't have to do that, and you're always taking a, a certain kind of uh, uh, chance when you're doing something like that, you can just say it's not my business, but he doesn't do that, he saves the king, and he becomes actually the prime minister of of uh, Persia because Achashverosh is still the king, but you know you need you need somebody competent to, to, to rule this country. It can either be a Russia like Haman or it can be a Tzadik uh, like like Mordechai, but you need somebody competent to, to, to run it. So uh, and it says in the Megillah. By the way, this is the Chilul Hashem of the Megillah. Shekol yeter divrei gedulato shel Mordechai alo ktuvim emal sifrei bemalchei paras umadai which means that the whole story of Mordechai as a, a leader, as the, as a, like, uh, a.k.a. Prime Minister of, of Persia, it's not written in Melachim, in our book. It's not written in Melachim Gimel. He doesn't become the king of Israel. It's written in the history books of ancient Persia. So he did dedicate most of his life uh, on the quantitative level to uh, helping this, this kingdom. Okay, but But the truth is that Mordechai... Uh, is doing everything. His whole life is out of a, a very deep Jewish identity. I think he's the only guy that we call Mordechai HaYehudi. Well, I mean, of course he's the only one we call Mordechai Yehudi. He's, he's the only guy who we call HaYehudi. We don't call other people HaYehudi. Mordechai, it's like he's the Jew. He's the, the ultimate Jew. And maybe people in his time, they didn't, they didn't know how much his Jewish identity was the the real depth of this this person, but that's his his motivation in life. And when he's introduced, what does it say? It says uh, that he, he he's coming from that he's in the Galut, right? 
אשר הגלה, it says four times גלות in one פסוק. There's no place in the Tanakh where it says four times גלות in, in, in the same פסוק. And this is to emphasize that Mordechai, though he's an executive in the Persian government, he knows that he's in גלות. It's very important. For a Jew, wherever he is, he can be a loyal citizen. We're not talking about some kind of a traitor. He does help the Persian and he, uh, uh, Persian Empire, and, and, and he, he is loyal. But, but every Jew out of Israel, he, he should be conscious of the fact that he's in the Galut. He's not in the natural uh, habitat of his nation. And Mordechai is working to help the Jews get back. And this, for this, we need a lot of uh, sources from Chazal explaining what Mordechai was doing and how he led to the uh, rebuilding of, uh, of Beit HaMikdash. So Mordechai, on the outer side, he's a Persian a patriot and a civil certain, servant, but his inner side is totally Jewish, and he's doing his best to protect his people, the Jewish nation, And we can hear it in his wonderful speech to, to, to Esther, which influenced many Jews in all kinds of situ- situations. Uh, we have reached this level of power to help our people and to defend the Jewish nation. And that, that, that is said specific, specific, specifically in the Megillah, but uh, based on Chazal, we can say not only to defend the lives of the Jewish uh, people, but also to help Um, show the way back to Eretz Yisrael and rebuilding the Beit HaMikdash, which happens in the next uh, generations. The Jews in the Megillah, they're also in a, some kind of a masquerade because they, uh, they lost much of their Jewish identity. They were deep in the Galut. Many people believe that there's no way back and, you know, this is, this is what, we're, what, what has become of us. And true, the Prophet said that one day we'll come back to Eretz Yisrael and rebuild our, our country and our Beit HaMikdash. It looked very bleak, okay? The whole party, you know, Chazal explained that the whole party that Achashverosh was holding was, was because they thought that the 70 years that uh, Yirmiyahu predicted and prophetized uh, that would uh, pass until the Jews come back, they thought it w- uh, that, that, they, that date had passed. They didn't count it right, and they thought that, you know, Uh, the Jewish people is uh, in Israel is a matter of the past, and that was the party that he held, and the Jews participate in this party, okay? And they, they're a part of the Persian cult- culture, and they don't have their own language. They sent Sfarim to Medina, uh, Medina Kichtava, Am Ve'am Kilshono, all the people, but the Jewish people are not mentioned at the beginning. So actually, uh, the Jewish people uh, lost their identity, Uh, in a way you could say in Persia there's the Mahloket in Chazal if it was if, if this decree uh, was because uh, for us uh, those two Perushim are basically the same Perush it means the Jews stopped being Jewish they didn't uh, have a, a clear strong Jewish identity and that changes because never never give up on any Jew not on the personal level and not on the collective uh, level Never uh, believe that Klal Yisrael, you know, th- things could be the, the worst, but we, we always come back. It happened in Hanukkah, it happened in Purim. Interesting that both of the uh, Chagim that we have, Midra Banan, are based on the same thing, that it seemed as the Jews were going to become assimilated and lose their identity, but we came back. That's uh, what's common uh, between Hanukkah and Purim. And last but not least... You know who was also in disguise in the Megillah? The main disguise in the Megillah. Hashem. Hashem. Ribbono shel olam. We don't see him in the Megillah. He's never mentioned. Not even once. You can read the whole Megillah as some kind of a secular history, wonderful fa- uh, historic fantasy or whatever people believe about it, but you can read it as if, as if it's not even a religious book. Now, of course, we know that whenever it says HaMelech, so Chazal say that's Malko Shel Olam, but it's Hashem actually in disguise. But Hashem is in disguise. Okay, there's no prophecy here. We don't hear Hashem speaking, but we do hear Hashem speaking loud and strong in this Megillah. And that's maybe the biggest chidush of the Megillah, the perspective. That's the perspective. That's what writing a book in Ruach HaKodesh means. Because there are a lot of things that happen in the Megillah that not... Not everybody would even connect between these events. Like the whole story with uh, Bigtan and Teresh at the beginning, that was years before the Megillah happened. Okay, understanding that this is intertwined and connecting it and understanding the dynamic, 
This is actually understanding how uh, Hashem is always in history, the planter of history. Korea Dorot Merosh, He's inside there. So when we have prophets, it's easier to see. When we don't, we need more emuna. But we should always know and believe. And this is the message of the Megillah, that Hashem is, is behind history. Hashem is with us. And even when it seems that He's uh, not here, it's, uh, so it's what, what we would call uh, Elohim be incognito, okay, in disguise. So Hashem is not mentioned. He doesn't speak, but He actually is speaking loudly and clear, clearly. And, you know, for, for our reality and most of our generations, th- this is a better sh- uh, shiur in Emuna, a lesson in Emuna, than other books. Because when we read about the miracles uh, of Yetziat Mitzrayim, and uh, when we read about the, the, the prophecies, so it's very uplifting, but we don't have that today. Our everyday life is much more like Megillat Esther, Okay, where everything is in hester, everything is uh, is actually in disguise. It's hidden, and you have to look into it. And maybe that's the reason we remember this character named Charvona. Okay, because Charvona, it's an interesting story. There's also a famous song, you know, Gam Charvona Zachula Tov. It's it's part of Shoshana Yaakov, but it became an independent. It split off to be become an independent song, and you can see people singing Charvona, Charvona, singing about this guy. Who is this dude? Why do we remember Charvona uh, so warmly? Well, uh, to make the question even bigger, I'll say Charvona was probably not a very good character because he's the one who knew what Haman was doing last night, right? He's the one who tells Achashverosh that Haman built this tree to hang Mordechai. How does he know all of this? You can say that it was common knowledge, but they didn't have internet and, and, and Twitter. How did he know this? So some of the Mepharshim say it's because he was actually one of Haman's henchmen. He was, he was in on it. And that's why he knew not only that Haman made the tree, which is something visible other people could see, but also that he planned to hang Mordechai in this tree. So he might have himself be, been one of these anti-Semites or Amaleki people. Maybe. Okay? But why do we remember him? Because he actually, in one pasuk, he showed us the whole story of the Megillah. And which is this pasuk? This is the pasuk in which he sees the larger picture. Okay? In one view, he tells uh, Achashverosh the whole story. He says, wait a minute. He tells the whole story. He connects everything together. For one moment, and this may be Russia, and if not, just right ordinary person okay for one moment he's uplifted to be almost like a, a, a navi not understanding what's going to be in the future but at least understanding the divine uh, story of of the past and how everything is connected and everything is leading to the yeshua and to the geula of purim and he gives of course Achashverosh the uh, the inspiration the idea but i think also the inspiration to just see it all from a godly perspective what is tanakh what is tanakh it's not a history book there are a lot of things interesting things that aren't told in the tanakh it's the divine perspective of history and the reason we're reading about it is not because of the past and we'll, maybe we'll end in this drasha it says anybody who reads the megillah backwards he he's not yoitze uh, it's his mitzvah is not fulfilled, but uh, not but and and the Baal Shem Tov he says Kola Koreta Megillah Lemafria, wonderful uh, perush, not the pshad, okay, it's the Hasidic uh, perush. He says anybody who reads the Megillah Lemafria backwards, he thinks it's about history. Lo Chovato, he didn't understand the story of Purim. We're reading about this uh, divine understanding of the, 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 the sequence of what happened in, in the Megillah to teach us something about our life today, our personal life and our national life and what's happening in the world. Uh, we're, we're, we're celebrating Purim. Nothing in Judaism is really based on the past. We're always looking towards the fu- future. We're learning from the past how to understand what's happening now and where Hashem is taking us. And that Hashem loves Am Yisrael and that He'll always take care of Am Yisrael and that He's going to bring us back home. And Baruch Hashem, uh, we're here uh, in the state of Israel. And uh, we believe that uh, the Geula uh, has begun, but it's only, it's only the beginning. There's much more to come. And we believe in Hashem's uh, love for, for Am Yisrael. 
and that the whole story of history, though we have had uh, very, very difficult and rough stations, and nobody uh, can promise us that uh, our hardships are totally behind us, but Hashem di Bertov al Israel, Hashem loves Am Israel, and He's bringing us back, and we believe that even the difficult stations, they were uh, necessary parts in our uh, Geula, but Hashem is doing it, is doing it for us. And when we say for us, it's for the whole world because Am Yisrael is lived by Evarim. We have a, a universal uh, role and obligation, and that's why uh, the importance of our return to, to Eretz Yisrael is not only for us as a nation, but rather for for the whole world. As the Orach Haim Hakadosh says, Ashrei Olam Sheuma Zo Betocho. So we try to unveil a bit uh, what's going on in the Megillah and show how everybody is actually uh, in some kind of a disguise. And uh, that's the, the idea of Purim, to rip the mask, use the mask and the costume and the wine to actually uh, tear apart the fabrications we have about reality and see the inner truth that is actually, uh, that is actually behind it and to see the divine light of Kedusha, of Ashgachat Hashem, in our everyday reality. Thank you very much. Purim Sameach from Eretz Yisrael.